There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. Um, Barb mentioned my involvement in the um, Saturday history programs in Jacksonville and um, this program today originated um, for one of those Saturday programs, Seth Weintraub and Dirk Siglecki, who heads all of the activities there in the historic cemetery. All, um, all of us put together this research on leisure time activities um, in and around the Rogue Valley from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. That program was an hour and a half long, but it included walking around the cemetery sites of various famous um, baseball players and athletes in our area as well as some of the ardent sponsors. We're not going to do walking around except after um, I talk I'm hoping that you'll wander up here and look at some of the old toys that I just happen to have around in my house. I'm sure you still have some and, and many others. I um, was sorry that I was um, missing some famous things that I'm sure you enjoyed playing. Um, and then I've also left out, Seth had a lot of information on the history of the organization of baseball in our country, and that was quite long and involved. So I've omitted that as well as really ancient history about horse racing. So I've just gone back as far as um, early 1800s. Well, when the settlers very first arrived here in this area, there was no time for leisure or entertainment. They were just intent on survival. And then gradually, as families and businesses um, became established, then some, some social events um, began developing through churches and um, people found time for visiting. There were um, um, I guess baseball teams began forming, and we, oh, there's our, one of our first, so the Ashland A's. Um, and I have one of the photos up here for you to see on the back. It names um, who the players were, which is kind of fun. Um, but there were three major changes that occurred that caused this um, advance in entertainment and sports activities. And the very first one was the Industrial Revolution, um, because then there were um, increases in the use of machinery and the appearance of modern conveniences. Um, running water and electricity was available in Jacksonville and Ashland in the early 1900s. The newfangled inventions um, saved time for men in their workplaces, and women found household chores much less time consuming. So there was finally now time for entertainment and enjoyable activities like sports. Um, historians actually see a strong link between technological innovation and the increased popularity of sports. Um, for example, the development of the telegraph and telephone helped newspapers report on sporting events in one city for the next. And then there were new forms of transportation, um, such as trains, um, that helped athletic teams travel to, from city to city. And then mass transit, um, in this area there were some streetcars that helped spectators reach sporting venues. And before streetcars, um, there were some other, there were um, touring cars and there was actually a car that you could hire, I think it was 35 cents to go from Jacksonville to Medford. So there were means of getting um, from one sporting event to another. And then the sports themselves were improved by technology. Um, light bulbs in the 1890s um, were available then to light up sporting um, arenas. They could light up the indoor as well as outdoor sporting arenas. And then um, the creation of vulcanized rubber improved sports equipment, um, balls, but one of the funny ones if you think about it is bicycle tires. Um, then secondly, well first was Industrial Revolution, and then um, secondly was the end of the Civil War. Um, and, and after 1865, there were more changes because during the war, so many men were missing that that began a time when women were permitted and were seen more outside the home. They actually needed to be outside of the home in many cases to support their families. and. Um, 
during the Civil War, there were so very many deaths that um, nearly everyone was dressed in, in mourning. The country was immersed in that really tragic, very sad time for so long that when the war ended, after 1865, there was this um, amazing need for some kind of gaiety and entertainment. So that sparked a lot of the um, entertainment and activities for amusement. And then third, around 1900, there were developed some um, changes in um, medical care when there was a recognition for the first time that exercise was important for your health. So all those factors, Industrial Revolution first, then the end of the Civil War, um, and then and with the Civil War, of course, came the need, the recognized need for enjoyment in life and, and women being able to participate in activities outside the home. But then third, there was their, that awareness of um, the benefits of exercise and activity. So all of those led to a surprising amount of leisure activities that popped up. Um, one of those in this area was horse racing. It was a, a favorite pastime for many residents in Southern Oregon in the late 1800s, 1900s, and even now um, there still are some annual events in the area. Um, William Bybee, who many of you have heard of, settled in Jacksonville in 1854. He was a very um, influential and important man in local government, but also in various aspects of agricultural businesses that began developing here. He and his brother both were very involved in the breeding and racing of thoroughbred horses. Um, it said that Bybee at one time owned 5,000, maybe even 7,000 acres around this area. But um, even though his principal activity was raising stock, um, that, and I want to quote here, it says, um, Horses were run at Bybee's where a course famous up and down the coast was used by owners of thoroughbreds whenever the occasion demanded. Um, the Mail Tribune goes on to tell us that um, the Bybee homestead out on um, Old Stage Road, it's just a quarter of a mile outside of Jacksonville, um, it still stands. It was built between 1857 and 1861 and is now the historic Bybee Inn. Um, when we were doing our research on this topic, we didn't come across anything that reported about wagers out at the Bybee homestead, but uh, we think it's pretty safe to assume that um, betting <laughs> did occur, um, because one of the articles that we found about the Oregon State Fair, which was, that was long considered an annual summertime event, first in Salem, um, although it actually had modest beginnings in Oregon City in 1861. But at the time, local ministers were urging the boycott of the Oregon State Fair because of horse racing. It was reported that despite their plea, attendance was not affected. <laughs> um, the, then the Jackson County Fair was founded in 1859 and it became a summer highlight for local residents um, and it's much as it is now to show off crops and uh, livestock, special projects. It was a chance to see latest inventions, exhibits, um, to socialize and horse racing was also part of the um, excitement that was added to the fair. The Jacksonville Democratic Times, July 17, 1891, reported that a special horse race would be run at the fairgrounds near Central Point on Monday, August 22, 1891. The interesting race, it says, would be a single dash at a distance of one quarter mile. The entrance fee will be $20, which will be added to the purse. Five or more horses to enter. The first horse takes the money, the second horse saves the entrance fee. All horses must be entered on or before August 8, 1891. For information, address J.C. Hall, Central Point. Today, thoroughbred horse racing continues to be um, a spectator event across the United States. Um, but there is still a local event um, at the Josephine County Fairgrounds. 
However, it was the sport of baseball that became even more popular. Um, for the most part, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, oh, and this is the um, 18, or no, 1900 Pro Bowl team, I think. Um, Barb helped me with um, all these. I should um, tell you that even though we don't have walks to cemetery sites, I think even better, we've got all these photos that um, Barb and I um, found through my grandmother's old photo album. It's 1917 to 1920, which w inspired some of this research. And then Barb found a lot of these wonderful pictures from the Southern Oregon um, Historical Society's collection. And we've put a few books up here that are available in our library, but I will refer to Joe Peterson, who's my next door neighbor, I'm <laughs> pleased to say. But um, Joe has a lot of photographs that he got from Sk um, Terry Skibby, who has spoken here. So I'll um, give them credit as we go along, too. That was very helpful in our research. Um, but it was, for the most part, um, baseball in the late 1800s, early 1900s was a man's sport, especially in Southern Oregon. But on the East Coast, things were different. The young ladies attending Vassar College formed their baseball team in 1866. They were joined by other women's colleges, including Smith College in 1879, Mount Holyoke in 1891, Wellesley in 1897, and St. Mary's College in 1905. In addition to colleges, the women's teams such as the Boston Bloomers Ladies Baseball Club <laughs> um, traveled as a professional barnstorming women's baseball team and they played against other barnstormers, other college teams, amateur baseball clubs, and sometimes even professional clubs. In 1897, the Boston Bloomers traveled here to Southern Oregon and played against the Medford and Ashland teams. Well, there seems to be a little disagreement as to which teams actually won. We couldn't find the scores. Um, <laughs> reportedly, the Boston Bloomer ladies drew a large crowd, and they claimed to have left town on the Pullman Palace train $96 richer, and still claim to be the champion baseball ladies of the world. <laughs> In the late 1800s, this sports craze was sweeping the nation. Work weeks, though, were still long. They averaged about 60 hours a week. Um, yet that work week was much less than it had been 30 years before. But by 1920, workers would have added um, 10 more hours of work that they could turn into free time. So um, that meant a 50-hour week instead of a 60-hour week. And with that, the participation in sports, leisure, amusement activities multiplied. Baseball was quickly becoming the national pastime. It graduated from a gentleman's game to a form of mass entertainment. Cities and towns dedicated more and more land um, for recreational purposes, and baseball became more and more popular. Those who didn't enjoy playing were given the opportunity then to watch and attend these baseball games. In Southern Oregon, baseball was just as popular as it was in the rest of the state and across the country, with local cities and towns having their own teams. Um, there, um, Barb found Gold Hill, and I think, yeah, here's the, here are the Ashland A's again. Um, and the Ashland A's were actually the champions um, in the early 1880s. And then in 1877, oh, and what's so interesting to get a picture of what all was going on, in 1887, um, that was also when the Sterling Mine Ditch Trail was being dug. So a lot going on around here then. Um, but the Jacksonville team was named the Oregon champions um, in 1887. Um, a couple of those on the team actually went on to play professionally, and I'll talk about those in just a, a few minutes. Jacksonville's team uh, was called the Gold Bricks, and it was owned by George Bum Newber. 
um, played at the Newber Taylor Field, and it was located on Fifth Street across from the B.F. Dowell House, where Ray's Market is now. I can't drive by there without imagining. They said the baseball field had an eight-foot um, fence around it so that spectators without tickets couldn't um, watch the game, but it was also to keep um, really high fly balls from going into the rest of the town. Um, but prior to that new field, the one Ray's Market um, being built, the actually games prior to the 1900s were played out at Barbie at Bybee's, you know, the place where we um, saw the horse racing. Um, baseball games were also part of another big leisure time activity, the Fourth of July celebrations all around here. Um, in 1916, there was also a Fourth of July rodeo. Um, the rodeo. Um, caused the celebrations to go on for three days. It was held in Grants Pass, Medford, and Ashland. So July 4th, 5th, and 6th were part of uh, Fourth of July celebrations in 1916. And the Fourth of July usually started um, with a parade in the morning. The baseball team, often the town's baseball team, um, marched in the parade with shouts and whistles and um, cheering from all the, the crowd. Um, then they had ceremonies. They usually had a community picnic. Finally, the big game, or in 1916, the big rodeo. And then fireworks followed all that in the evening. So it was a, a big event. And then, as we'll get to later, um, following all that were the Chautauqua Theater events that went on 10 days following the 4th of July. So a lot of leisure time activities during that period. On November 17, 1913, a big exhibition game, the only one to be played in Oregon, was held in Medford. It was between the Chicago White Sox and the New York Giants. The Southern Pacific ran trains from Reading and Roseburg to bring fans here to see the game. The Mail Tribune reported a special train would bring the players from San Francisco to Medford in 14 hours or less to ensure they would arrive in the city by 9 o'clock on Monday morning of the game. And I want to quote the Tribune here. The ball players traveled on a train deluxe, six cars in the train, including baggage and diners. The paper reported this to the curious fans. Um, then the paper went on to say, after Medford secured the big players in game, every town in Oregon, from Portland to Grants Pass, is seeking the game, but none came through with the guarantee in time. Judge Colvig of Jacksonville, and some of you may know he was Bozo the Clown's father, um, Judge Colvig wrote to the Portland editors, inviting them to be present, and added, it takes money and nerve to land such an event. Medford has both. <laughs> and that's, what was interesting is that um, the general admission was a dollar. Grandstand tickets were two dollars but the Medford was able to guarantee the spectators to make that a profitable event. And there were, as I mentioned before, some really amazing players um, from this area. Some of them did go on to play professionally. In June of 1884, George McConnell, my favorite, and his Ashland Tour teammates climbed aboard a six-horse horse stagecoach headed for Wairika, California, and a game with the Wairika Town team. They were met, this was a big deal, they were met by a brass band, and a dance was held that evening after Ashland's lopsided victory. George McConnell also put on an exhibition of his curveball. The Wairika fans were thrilled to see the first curveball ever thrown, as far as they knew. Although the Ashland Tidings credited George McConnell with being the first to successfully throw a curveball in the country, an East Coast major leaguer of the 1870s is generally recognized as the first curveball pitcher. Candy Cummings um, claimed he invented the pitch after seeing a spinning clamshell curve across the water as it was being skipped. 
However, in 1884 in Wairika, nobody was talking about Cummings or his clamshells. It was the George McConnell fellow who fascinated them. McConnell claimed he got the idea of a curveball from playing billiards, and we're not sure how that works. Um, <laughs> But then locally, there was also Kenneth Roy Williams, born in 1890 in Grants Pass. He was only 25 years old when he broke into the big leagues, joining the Cincinnati Reds in 1915. He died in Grants Pass in 1959, and he's buried at the Hillcrest Cemetery in Grants Pass. Edward Henry Wilkinson, born in 1890 in Jacksonville, played for the New York Highlanders in the 1911 season. The Highlanders would later become the New York Giants, uh, or New York Yankees, excuse me. And sadly, um, Wilkinson contracted pul uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, so he died young at the age of um, 27. He's buried in the Catholic section of the Jacksonville Cemetery. And then there was Henry Houston Hub Pernol, also known as Piano Legs and Judd. <laughs> he was born in 1888 in the Applegate. He played two seasons with the Detroit Tigers in 1910 and 1912, and he died in 1944 in Grants Pass. And still another, Benjamin Biddy Dowell was a Jacksonville boy and son of Benjamin Franklin Dowell and his wife of the Dowell House across the street from that old baseball field. He played for Portland for a while and then he became Portland's city fire chief. Um, then there was Edward the Midget Menser, son of Henry Menser and grandson of Morris and Matilda Menser. They were among the only there were seven early Jewish pioneers in Jacksonville. Edward was nicknamed the Midget because he was only five and a half feet tall and weighed less than 150 pounds. The Midget played for the Pittsburgh Pirates and promptly became the first Jewish switch hitter in Major League history. He died in 1970 at the age of 85. All the Mincers were long living. Um, but now back to the women. Um, besides baseball, there were women's basketball teams. And this was really what started all this research because I remembered a photo that my grandmother had showed me, so proud, a 1907 photo of her in her bloomers on her basketball team. Um, I couldn't find the photo of her, although uh, Barb was able to find um, pictures of girls in their uniforms, which consisted of the duck white midi blouses, the black ties. Um, they had black serge bloomers, which were really heavy, quite a hindrance when they first began playing. And then about the 1920s, the bloomers were, um, the serge bloomers were replaced with um, black sateen, a cotton that was much lighter weight and allowed for uh, more movement. And um, Oh, and I should mention, too, that putting together photo albums like my grandmother's was another pastime in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Photo albums, scrapbooks. In fact, when we think about it, some of those early photographs um, dating back to Peter Britt um, in the 1850s, um, some even earlier. Um, and then by the 1900s, Photography had become available for a mass market, and I was telling Barb, they kept referring to the Brownie Hawkeye, and I thought, oh, I'm really old, I remember my little Brownie camera, but fortunately I didn't, didn't save that. Um, but if you browse through my grandmother's photo album, which I brought um, here, you'll see pictures of men and women playing tennis and croquet, um, lawn bowling, all of those, which was also called bocce ball. That was my grandmother, by the way, and this is um, my aunt and a couple of her romping friends. Um, not pictured in my grandma's album. Men and women enjoyed shuttlecock, um, badminton, horseshoes. Um, I didn't see photos of my grandma bicycle riding, but that activity became really popular on the East Coast as early, and I was amazed, as early as 1819. The first bicycle was called a hobby horse. 
the bone shaker <laughs> that succeeded it um, was the one that succeeded about 1850. And if you think of the wooden wheels, again, you know, that improvement in sports equipment to um, move from wooden to rubber wheels was quite an advancement. Um, reporting on the history of cycling, the Medford Mail Tribune states in May 1920, and I quote, this is so funny, when the fair cyclists of 1875 perched themselves on the clumsy contraptions of those early periods, they were subjects of more ridicule than envy. That's the end of the quote. <laughs> 20 years later, and this is now 1895, the Bloomer girls all had bikes. That's when the bicycle craze around 1895 swept through the Rogue Valley. Um, the Mail Tribune tells us, and again I quote them, women who rode fast or who raced were nicknamed scorchers. <laughs> Um, women made up about a third of the cyclists in the 1800s, says Amy Drake. Um, she was formerly the curator at the um, Southern Oregon Historical Society. She says bicycle riding, and I quote Amy, was a craze of the upper middle class in Jackson County. Bicycling gave, gave women a new sense of freedom and independence. It joined canoeing, tennis, and golf as a physical activity enjoyed by the Victorian elite, she says. But then um, by the 1960s, bicycles became cheaper and more available, and so they were more available then to the lower classes. Bicycling was no longer restricted to the elite. Um, then we also had, and again for women locally, uh, we had the Women's Broom Brigade, which I had never heard of. But in the 1860s, men were proud to be in local, when army uniforms, um, although locally uh, there were no Civil War battles fought in this area. Still in their army, army uniforms, they practiced drills with their rifles and muskets in hand. Um, there was a boys, and Bill Miller tells us this, a boys marching drill team, the Hoo Hoo Squad, <laughs> um, that regaled everyone with its complex maneuvers, Bill tells us. Young women were also eager to take part in those patriotic displays, but women couldn't join the army and they certainly weren't issued weapons at that time. Women weren't allowed in the army until 1917. So around the time of the Civil War, young women in Jacksonville and elsewhere took to developing routines with their brooms, somewhat a mix of um, soldiers marching drills and baton twirling. <laughs> And then also, by the turn of the century, women, still not allowed to have weapons, did become adept at target shooting. Um, target shooting was considered an appropriate sport for ladies as well as gentlemen. Again, Bill Miller tells us this. Um, when he wrote about an article about a 1902 Medford shoot, organized primarily for men, but he tells us that Jesse Enyart's 16-year-old daughter, Hazel, fired the first shot of her life at a clay target and succeeded in killing it. Her, her achievement brought her the honor of killing a bear which was butchered into steaks and served at the evening banquet in Medford. Um, a contingent of ladies, including Oregon and Northwest champion Mrs. W. F. Sherrod, would also compete in that 1902 tournament in Medford. But then um, swimming became available for women. Um, in the early 1900s, um, natatoriums, those early swimming pools, became very popular. Most were indoor. Um, the, but in Ashland, in addition to the um, natatorium, there were the twin plunges. There was a pool for men and a pool for women. Um, the plunges were situated where the co-op is now, for those of you who know Ashland. They actually blocked off the natural waters that flow through there, and it just, I feel like, how sad that when we're shopping, we're right on top of those two old pools that were there. Really, Terry Skibby, I think, shared some of his photos and will tell you that he had his graduation party there. Um, 
At the natatoriums, there were free days and swimsuits offered to the ladies uh, to encourage them to enjoy recreational swimming. The Mail Tribune in 1911 announced, and I'm quoting again, natatorium, Thursday afternoon, June 15th, ladies will be furnished bathing suits and a free swim between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m the end of the quote. The swimsuits lent to the ladies were very modest, of course. Um, several styles can be seen in my grandmother's photo album. And then Barb found one of her mother-in-law there on the left. Um, the picture on the right has my aunt, and we can't figure out, we think, distant cousin on the other side. And I happen to be wearing another style of swimsuit under here. I'll just give you a quick flash, although all these wires were certainly not part of the costume. That would have been a little um, dangerous. It's risque enough. Um, and um, the natatorium served several functions. The natatorium in Jacksonville was in the Orth building, which is still there. Um, and that also housed a gymnasium. The natatorium on North Riverside in Medford um, Oh, and here's another great quote, was the center of more diverse and exciting events than any other building in Medford. The main ballroom was the scene of concerts by many of the performers of the day. The pool was used as an arena for prize fights. Banquets were held for large groups. Um, the grounds around the Nat included a park. Free band concerts were held during the summer. And here, more of this quote, in 1911, the Nat also functioned as one of Medford's six theaters, including the Opera House, where live performances or, or silent films could be presented. And the Tribune proclaimed, the Nat Theater is now open every night and Saturday and Sunday afternoons, the coziest and coolest theater in town. <laughs> finest light and best film subjects. Come once and you will come again. <laughs> um, and men too, of course, enjoyed bicycling, swimming. Um, they were more involved in the target and trap shooting and hunting than women. In 1905, that two-day shooting tournament um, was sponsored primarily for men, the one that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, it was sponsored by the Medford Gun Club and it was advertised as plenty of enjoyment, promising you'll be able to see some of the world's greatest shooters. There was W.R. Crosby, who set the record for the longest straight run with a shotgun. 419 targets broken without a miss. His stiffest competition, the dude, Fred Gilbert, was British, US, and world champion trap shooter of 1901. The targets were uh, glass balls, clay pigeons, and there was an occasional goose. Um, <laughs> the Medford newspaper declared the event an unqualified success of the day, sure to be remembered and talked of favorably in every state of the union. Bill Miller tells us that. Shooting events were held throughout the year. Um, in December 1888, the Sentinel announced a turkey shoot in Jacksonville. Willie Bilger arranged for several turkeys to, pe to be put up for a shooting match, and he advertised that um, good shots need not purchase holiday turkeys now, as they can get them a great deal cheaper at the shooting match. Leave your name at Max Mueller's store. Max Mueller was another one of those early Jewish settlers in Jacksonville. And then wrestling and boxing were popular sporting events for men. Some matches were held in the local natatoriums or gymnasiums. In fact, boxing remained so popular in our area that as late as 1935, when the Oregon Shakespeare Festival was due to open for the first time, the city council in Ashland was worried that the theater presentations wouldn't have enough attendance to pay for the costs of the, um, of the festival, so they insisted that boxing matches be held on the stage prior to the plays. It turns out, though, as we know, uh, the theater was able to sustain itself, even more than boxing, as popular a sport as it was.
But prior to the theater and opera houses being built, Chautauqua assemblies provided sermons, lectures, music, and a variety of entertainment in rural America, which is what Joe Peterson um, tells us. Chautauqua presentations began in 1874 in New York at Lake Chautauqua, where Methodist Sunday school teachers gathered for edification. Um, Kit Leary and Joe Peterson, in their books about Ashland and the Shakespeare Festival, which are up here for you to see, um, they provide great stories and photos of the first Chautauqua Dome in Ashland, nearly 20 years after the Methodists met by that lake in New York in the 1890s. There were Chautauqua gatherings all over the country, um, lasting, as I mentioned before, for 10 days or two weeks following Fourth of July celebrations. It cost a dollar to attend 10 days of celebrations. <laughs> In Southern Oregon, thousands came to attend. The visitors needed places to stay. Central Point did have a campground in 1890, but Ashland had electricity, better lights, um, they had city water, they had good hotels in addition to camping facilities. And so there they built the Ch Chautauqua Dome in 1893. It held 1,000 people. It was expanded in 1905 to hold 1,500, and then again in 1917 to hold 5,000. Chautauqua Park, now Lithia Park, um, next to the dome on Ashland Creek, provided tent camping for $1.50 per season. The Ladies Chautauqua Park Club and Ladies Improvement Society improved the campgrounds prior to each Chautauqua event. A camp communal kitchen was established, there was playing in the creek for the children, and camping became a great source of outdoor entertainment. And for those of you, some of you may know, some of you may be interested, one of the early um, auto park cabins is still available to see in Ashland Park, just on the path above from where the park headquarters were. They've maintained um, one of those early auto camp cabins, and if you peek in the window, you can see the um, old tile, probably full of asbestos, which they were proud of in those days, and the ice box. But it's, it's quaint to be able to walk up there and see that. Um, but in addition to outdoor activities, inside, men, women, children invited a variety, they enjoyed a variety of parlor games. Um, some of them are still are played at home, but also in, um, in saloons um, and um, and in bars, um, games like poker, of course, but then there was whist, an old maid, and solitaire. Um, the parlor games enjoyed most, and I have some were dominoes, checkers, chess, cribbage. And I, was, I was amazed, it dates back to the 1600s. Backgammon is 5,000 years old. Mahjong also dates back to 1600s, but it was certainly played by the Chinese in the Jacksonville area um, in the 1800s. And Mahjong, as many of you know, is still played here today in a lot of community and senior centers. Um, Parcheesi um, playing began in 1869 and tic-tac-toe in 1864. It was called knot and crosses, but we think it could be traced back even to Egyptian times. Children's games played in the 1800s, and many of them are still played today. Uh, marbles, and I brought my pickup sticks, jacks. Um, they played mental arithmetic, Simon Says, which we all know, hide and seek, leapfrog. Um, they played football, but they played it with a pig's bladder. Um, they played um, baseball, hit the bat, um, and ball games that we're also familiar with still, uh, with catch and juggling, um, bouncing balls against the wall. They played hopscotch, they played with dolls. Paper dolls were really important um, for girls in the 1800s and early 1900s, but I thought, I remember paper dolls in the 1940s, so they continued long after that. Children had running races, um, they had rolling hoops, jump rope, cup and ball, drums. They played drop the handkerchief or duck duck goose. Um, some games we don't hear of anymore. Conkers was popular and that was a combative game with chestnuts on a string. Um, 
We don't hear so much about knocking down ginger, but ding dong ditch, I remember. When you rang the bell and ran. Um, <laughs> and I'd never heard of um, pie crust coming or chuckle went over, but they described that as a popular game in which lines or teams of kids would hold on to one another's waist and then they'd try to swing or sway the line to see which team would fall down first. Um, and you may remember Red Rover, Red Rover, send Ann over. Remember, <laughs> um, that was also called forcing the city gates or octopus tag. And there was a game played by mischievous young boys. They would throw a rope over the uh, posts that jutted out, or the bars that jutted out from the old lamp posts. Those were the bars that the lamp lighters used to lean their ladders up against when they'd climb up to light the lamps before um, electric street lamps. And so these boys would throw a rope over those bars and then swing from that. And I was reminded of a similar game. You can see every summer at Lithia Park, kids will throw a rope over the limb of a tree that goes out over the reservoir at the top of the park and they swing way out over the water and then let go and plop in. And um, my grandson tried really hard to get me to do it. He said, Grandma, you'll be the oldest person to do this. <laughs> but I, I wasn't interested in setting any world records and I noticed that the police periodically come and cut those ropes down again and again um, because one of the main purposes of all the sports and activities, remember, was originally health and safety. And um, in conclusion, I want to uh, quote Carolyn Kingsnorth, um, chairman of Historic Jacksonville, Inc. She says, between 1870 and 1900, the growth of sporting activities for men, women, and children was phenomenal. The Industrial Revolution meant increased leisure time, but leisure did not mean idleness. Far from it. The core value of the Industrial Revolution was the work ethic. To forestall the mischief that Satan found for idle hands, you were expected to use your leisure time to pursue something useful and productive that was also recuperative and relaxing. That's the end of Carolyn's quote. So I hope this topic um, has been useful you, for you and relaxing and some entertainment for you all. It's been fun for me to put together.